that if you set the next milestone as just outside the distance of what you're comfortable with and you make it there, if you allow yourself a moment to register that win, you get energy to do to then set the next milestone and achieve it. You were talking earlier on about the fact that dopamine can be released when you set yourself a little goal and then achieve it. And one of the ways that you encourage your grad students is to give them a little bit of reward earlier on so that it keeps them motivated. Is this the same mentality that works during an endurance event when you want to say, I'm just going to get myself to the next lamppost. I've just got to get myself to that hill over there. Is that the same dynamic? Yeah, um, we can call it milestoning. You just set some milestone. And the key thing here is that, and this is the beauty of the dopamine system, just like the stress system is generic, the fear system is generic. It's designed for a bunch of different scenarios. The motivation system is also generic. It can be to achieve the next lamppost as a milestone, or it can be five miles as the next milestone. You get to control that. And it, so it's completely arbitrary, right? I mean, in, the, one of the most brilliant things that was ever said to me by an extremely skilled psychoanalyst is so simple, and yet I do think it's the most fundamental thing to understanding oneself is that it's all internal. Right? If you finish a marathon in first place, no one comes along and drips dopamine in your ear. You self-generate that. It's all internal. It's all about your internal representation. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't good and bad events in life, but the fact of the matter is that if you set the next milestone as just outside the distance of what you're comfortable with and you make it there, if you allow yourself a moment to register that win, you get energy to, do, to then set the next milestone and achieve it. That energy is dopamine converted into epinephrine, into adrenaline. And this is why you hear these incredible heroic stories. Like, I mean, I think the movie, sorry, I, I hate to say it, but the movie was less good than the book, but like Lone Survivor, the Marcus Luttrell story. And the, actually, I think today or yesterday might be the anniversary of Operation Red Wings. So all those guys sadly died except Marcus. And, you know, you, he, in the movie, he sort of, it's like fast forward to where he, I don't want to give it away, but where he basically is the lone survivor. But... In the book, it's crazy. I mean, the guy dragged himself on elbows and knees for miles and miles and miles, right? You know, th that kind of ability where you hear about people walking on stubs to, you know, these incredible feats of human um, endurance and willingness to persist. I mean, those people were able to do that not because of glycogen or they drank their goo or whatever the triathletes are always using. It's because of nervous system energy, the ability to continue to manufacture adrenaline and keep going. And the, and the extent to which that can continue is no one will ever know. I do believe that humans have a tremendous capacity to endure and persist, but that few human beings actually know how to tap into that system except under conditions of extreme survival. And you also hear from really good physicians, ones that aren't into woo biology or woo psychology at all, that to some extent, yes, there are people that unfortunately die in their battle against cancer, no matter what, but that the, the desire to continue living is a powerful force in of itself. There may be spiritual components, there may be, uh, that's not the business I'm in, uh, you know, so and how, I don't know the experiment I would do to test it, but almost certainly setting of milestones and the ability to generate dopamine and adrenaline is what allows people to persist and live longer. There's no question about that. One of the best books I've read this year is The Expectation Effect by David Robson. Oh, I need to read so this. he is a science writer from the UK and he looked at a whole bunch of studies, the placebo effect, which everybody is familiar with, right? There is a particular expectation that an outcome is going to come from some sort of medication, and lo and behold, that outcome manifests. He found this across pretty much every area of anything that you care to care about. So my two favorite studies from this, so so interesting. He realized that uh, gluten intolerance, self-report gluten intolerance, has increased from 3% to 30% in 10 years. So this is the why there's so many gluten-free options on the menu? Because they've got 30% of the population to serve, yeah, so people need it. And he was wondering, well, what is it? How, how, human biology hasn't changed that much. Is it maybe that the foods have changed and people are responding to that? Or is it maybe some sort of expectation because the uh, type of news stories that are hearing about gluten and about how bad it is for us and inflammation and all this sort of stuff, maybe it's that and people are expecting it. So they brought people into a, a lab. And they sit them down. These people do and do not have uh, self-reported gluten intolerances. And they give everybody the same meal. They tell everybody in the room that it's got gluten in it. It's got no gluten in it. After a while, people who don't have a gluten intolerance biologically, who haven't eaten gluten, have diarrhea, they have hives, they're breaking out in inflammation, they're having to run to the bathroom. Okay, well, that, that, that's kind of interesting. He did another, uh, another uh, story that he spoke about. VO2 max tests that they were looking at, apparently there's a particular genetic mutation that allows people to blow off CO2 and upregulate oxygen in a better way. Uh, they brought people in, even numbers of people that did and did not have this genetic trait, split them into two random groups. So there was a mix of both do and do not have the trait in each. First group was told, you've got the right genetic trait, you should be really, really good at this. Second group was told, oh, sorry, you don't have it, you shouldn't be too good. 
no surprise perhaps at the group that was told that they did, they ended up performing better. But when they actually looked at what was happening in the physiology of these people, they found that the people who didn't have the genetic mutation but were told that they did had a lower overall lactate threshold, they had a lower overall heart rate, they were blowing off CO2 more effectively and upregulating oxygen better than the people who did have the genetic mutation but were told that they didn't. So he coined this term that said your expectations are even more powerful than your genes. I love that. I'm going to read that book. I That's a remarkable example. Um, and I think that you know a lot these days is being made of epigenetic effects and things, but this is almost in a different direction. This is a psychophysiological response. Uh, I find this kind of thing, to be honest, among the more fascinating and interesting aspects of neuroscience, if not the most interesting lately, um, those examples are tremendous, so I, I can't uh, counter those at all with anything more spectacular. But the, the work of Dr. Uh, Alia Crum at Stanford, she runs the Stanford Mind-Body Lab, and she's done simple experiments, but they're really elegant, um, instructing people, one group, all about the terrible effects of stress. What destroys your immune system, et cetera, et cetera. Other people telling them also true things, but all the positive effects of stress. It sharpens your ability to function, you can remember things better, et cetera, et cetera. You see exactly what you are told, basically. Now, you can't lie to people. You can't tell them things that aren't true. It's just about the subset of information that you get dictates the response you get. And perhaps the most traumatic was they gave two different groups of people, and then they actually each got the opposite condition too, a milkshake. One group is told this milkshake is very high calorie, it contains a lot of fat and sugar, etc. Another group is told uh, the milkshake they're getting is very low calorie, it's very nutrient sparse, etc. Then they measure hunger, so how long it takes for them to get hungry again after ingesting it. They also look at insulin, and they also look at ghrelin, this hormone that is secreted um, as you get, essentially makes you hungry. It's associated with hunger. There are other things too, but you see exactly what you would expect, which is that people that get the nutrient dense milkshake are satisfied for longer. Their ghrelin is suppressed and their insulin is higher. You see the opposite in the group that had the, the so-called low calorie shake. Turns out it's the exact same milkshake. This is remarkable, right? Because this is not simply the placebo effect. I think it's the placebo effect plus the expectation effect plus a real physiological effect because that's what you describe as well. And the way that Ali, Dr. Ali Crum, as she, she uh, goes by, the way she describes it is that any event causes a real physiological response, but that real physiological response is braided in with our expectation and our understanding of what the response ought to be to create the actual response. So it's sort of real plus perceived equals Actual your reality, yes. right, exactly. And so um, I love this kind of thing, as you can tell. I'm, I'm eating up the example that, uh, that you gave. I think it's spectacular because what it means is that, no, we can't lie to ourselves. We can't tell ourselves that, you know, drinking water is going to sustain us just as food would for, uh, for five days. We're not going to be hungry. But to some extent, if one understands that, well, you can survive a long time on just water yeah. and you don't need to eat, then you might experience less hunger. That's the way the nervous system works. Well, you can definitely survive longer on just water if you believe that you can survive longer on just water. There is no reason not to believe this. So I was really, really averse to the whole Rhonda Byrne, the secret woo, sending out messages to the universe. And David uh, positions himself very anti that as well in the book. Um, but you can't deny the fact that the positive thinking has a real physiological impact on what you do. He was talking about, um, they did a study with older people uh, that were past retirement and they asked them to use what, what sort of words do you associate with getting older and they split these people into two different groups and the sort of words that people used perfectly mapped onto how long they were going to live so the people that used the sort of words alone, frail, fragile, injury, death they were the ones that lived the shortest the people that said um, happiness, freedom, liberty, connection uh, maturity, th th those sorts of words were the ones that lived the longest so your expectations can literally impact your longevity there's, I, I'm yet to read the book in detail, but I've talked to a guy named Ethan Cross. He wrote a book called He's Chatter. He's been on the show. Oh, He's fantastic. Show okay. I think that internal chatter world is a very interesting one that neuroscience will eventually have something to, to say uh, about. Uh, I think the most powerful mindset, uh, at least to me, is one that, again, I, I learned from Ali Crum. Um, this is a mindset that in her peer-reviewed studies of different populations, it's clear it exists um, universally in people in the SEAL teams, but um, less so or is perhaps even absent from the general population, sadly. The idea that stress grows you, that challenge grows you, but isn't the only way that you can grow, I think is a very powerful mindset. So, what do you mean, what do you mean by that? So they, she, what they did is she surveyed a bunch of different um, people, different professions, and asked, you know, what's your view of stress? Do you think it grows you? It diminishes your ability, et cetera. So this isn't giving people information. This is asking them for information. And the only group that said stress grows you, the more challenge, the better you get, et cetera. The more stress you experience, the more likely you are to, to succeed was the, this group from the SEAL teams. 
I don't know if they were new recruits or if they'd been in a long time, but that was the, the, the group. I would add to that, that yes, if you adopt the mindset that stress grows you, you're gonna be much better off, but also that stress is not the only way to grow in life, right? There's this idea, you know, we have this, and again, there's sort of a gravitational pull of this, like stress grows, yes. you, you know, forward center of mass, or, you know, yep. always be in friction, limbic yep. friction, limbic yep. friction. How about a, a more a, a expansive or nuanced version of that might be stress grows you. So if you're under stress, you're back on your heels from something, you think, okay, how can I get flat footed or even forward center mass? You tell yourself stress grows me, stress grows me, stress grows me. But that doesn't mean stress is the only thing that will grow you, right? Learning to cycle between periods of hard work and deep what I call non-destructive, uh, deliberate reset, right? Um, that's what really works over time. I can attest to that. You know, I, people who just really go out and tie one on in order to, to recover, you can only get away with that for a few years before your body and mind start to give out, right? So find non-destructive ways to reset and also adopt the mindset that stress grows you and adopt the mindset that, you know, there are other ways to grow that don't involve stress. And I think you're set up to have a pretty fantastic life. That's my, you know, simple view